All righty. Good morning, folks. We're going to be finishing the book of Jonah this morning. And I just have a, a question. Have you ever seen someone lose it in public? You know what I mean? Like just absolutely, like have a mental breakdown and just, you know, exhibit all their emotions on their sleeves. I worked at Chick-fil-A, so that was a daily occurrence, seeing people <laughs> lose it. Have you ever seen a Christian or someone you respect lose it? You know, that's, that's always an uncomfortable feeling. It's, it's more uncomfortable to witness, I feel like, than anything else. I remember one time uh, after church years ago, and, and this guy's a great guy. Uh, he, he, he was an elder before. He's an awesome guy. I'm not judging him based on this one event. But me and my friends went to go get some food after church, and he didn't see us there. But I saw him absolutely lose it to the cashier, and it was just a whole ruckus. And I, I don't even know what's going on. He might have been right. I don't know. But still, at the same time, it was just it was kind of unbecoming, you know, and it was more uncomfortable. Me and my friends, we just dipped when he just turned around. We left for like, oh, uh, it's too hard to watch. I don't want him to see us. And now that we saw us, so we just went on with our lives. Um, we're about to see a prophet lose it <laughs> in this chapter. We're going to see a prophet kind of have this mental breakdown before Yahweh. And I've titled this sermon, Waiting on the World to Burn. And I think that's what we're going to see with Jonah here in this book. So, Quick refresher, it's a lot of info, so we're just going to stick to the highlights. So only two names, only two specific names mentioned in the book of Jonah. Remember, it's Jonah and Yahweh, only names in the book. The Ninevites are just referred to the Ninevites, the sailors just referred to sailors, the king just as the king, no names to be had except for Jonah and Yahweh. Remember, God's looking out on his world. He sees the wickedness of the Assyrians rising up like a stench, and God's angry about it, and he wants it rectified. He wants it fixed. So he sends the people, the set-apart people that he used to tell his word, the prophets. In Hebrew, they were called the Nevim, and Jonah was one of them. But Jonah's not like any of the other prophets, is he? Because all the other prophets, they go and they proclaim, that's the whole book, Jonah, <laughs> he runs. And so you see this picture of, and you start to realize, especially by the end here, because most kids' books, guess what, they end at chapter 3. Nineveh repents, yay! It's not how the story ends, because that's not the point of the story. The story isn't about the Ninevites. It's not about the Assyrians. The story is about Jonah and Yahweh's relationship with him. So Jonah almost dies. Remember, he runs away as far as he can to Tarshish, 2,500 miles away. He runs the opposite direction. And remember, when does he finally pray to Yahweh? When he's drowning in the ocean, he calls out to God for the first time. He says he feared Yahweh. He said he was a prophet of Yahweh, an Israelite. But, of course, he didn't fear Yahweh. The sailors feared Yahweh. They repented, they made sacrifices, they made vows to God. It wasn't until Jonah was drowning did he actually call out to Yahweh. So remember, Jonah repents, God sends this big fish, he's thrown out onto dry land, or cod, <laughs> thrown up onto dry land, and he only goes, and I hope you caught that, remember how many sermons, hold, hold up the amount, how many words were in Jonah's sermon in, in Hebrew, remember? Five, very good, five words. And so, kind of a, an abbreviated sermon and if you remember, Nineveh was how big? It says it was a three days journey. Did you catch how far Jonah had went into the city? One day journey. So he only, only went one day out of a three day, and he only had five words of this prophecy. So something fishy, haha, fishy is going on here, right? Something weird is happening. I'm sorry to debase your intelligence like that. That was, a, that was my bad. And how did Nineveh respond to this little information they had? Remember, Yahweh's not mentioned. Repentance isn't, permission, isn't mentioned. Just 40 days, you're overturned. And that was it. It was just kind of a declarative statement. And they responded. Remember, everyone repents. From the greatest to the least of them. The king wears sackcloth and sits in ashes. He has all the cows wear sackcloth and tells the cows to call out to God. Remember, I, I was just, see the little cow. I don't know where... I showed this to Hannah last night, and she was like, where's their little sackcloth clothing? I'm like, I don't know. I guess they felt like it's too silly to put it on there. But this mass repentance to just this little information they had. And you think the history of the Israelites, they've had countless prophets, countless revelations of God's will for them, and God speaking directly to the people of Israel. And what did they constantly do? Contend. They continued to live their own lives. They continued in idolatry. And so Israel has that history, and then here's this foreign, completely pagan, evil, corrupt, upside-down moral landscape. Five words, and it does the trick. They repent. 
So now we see Jonah's response to the repentance. Verse 1, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Remember everything's huge or like superlative, great fish, great boat, hugely happy. He's hugely unhappy with this. And he was angry. In the Hebrew Bible, it says his heat anger arose. His heat anger. There's this relationship between hot, like heat, and anger. I like uh, some translations say, but all this seemed very wrong to Jonah. I think that captures the idea of this God caring about this people, that them repenting and God changing his mind about destroying him, it, it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't sit well with Jonah. So remember that heat and anger, because it's going to come into play. So verse 2, and he prayed. All right, this word doesn't just mean to pray. It means to earnestly pray. All right, so he's really concentrating. He's praying to God. What's this prophet's prayer? To the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, he's so mad. I mean, what a string of insults right there. I mean, how offended would you be if someone screamed this at you? Right? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous, and it's supposed to be comical to a degree, tragically comedic, but he's so angry because of the nature of God. He's angry because God is loving and forgiveness and kind, and it just doesn't seem right to him. Which leads you to ask, what kind of prayer is this? You ever prayed a prayer like that to God? Accusing, you know, accusing God. God, how dare you be gracious? I'm so angry at you that you would choose to do this. It's a very odd prayer, especially from a prophet. But he says he knew that God was like this. You've always been like this. I know you're like this. You know, it's like when you get in a bad fight with your spouse, you're like, you're always like this. You always do that. He's like, has the attitude towards God. You're, you've always been like this. But how did he know God's always been like this? Well, if you go all the way back to Exodus... Remember, God delivers the people out of slavery. Remember, God's giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And what do the people do in the meantime when they're waiting? They make the golden calf. They turn immediately to idolatry once they're freed. And remember, God uh, decides he's going to destroy him. Moses intercedes. And then God's like, okay, I'm not going to destroy. I'm going to preserve the promise for Abraham and his offspring and for your sake. Verse 6, it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Those attributes, all right, get this, those attributes are what saved the whole nation of Israel that day because God was thinking about entirely wiping them out. And Jonah knew the history of his people, and he knew that God was like this. So the very reason God allowed Jonah to be alive to exist in the first place and let alone you know not let the sea swallow him up and kill him right he sent the great fish as an act of mercy it was a severe mercy but that's the same attributes that jonah is mad at god for he wanted his cake and to eat it too <laughs> i want your grace i want your forgiveness i want your graciousness your loving kindness but for them god seriously they're evil they're messed up Remember the five-word sermon? I've said that a thousand times, but I want to save it till now. Jonah is angry. I've always wondered why he was so angry when he saw what happened, because God played a little trick on Jonah. And that sounds a little funny. God used a little word play on him. Who's ever heard the word gnarly? Yeah. Now, in growing up, especially, it was popular with the skating crew. I couldn't skate, but I, I was jealous of the kids who could skate. And they had this, this term. So they would say, like, gnarly you know you, you did a really cool all i don't know i skate i don't skateboard i don't know what the terms are they do a really cool trick and be like oh that was gnarly dude you know it means it was sick that was awesome that was so cool but also what i noticed is when when one of them would get an injury and it was like bleeding or something they'd look at it and they go oh that's gnarly meaning like oh that's bad like that's messed up so it had two completely opposite meanings right like gnarly is like super awesome or it's like Oh, that's painful and terrible. and uh, Oh, kind of the same as sick, right? Sick, like that's cool. Or I'm sick. Completely different meanings. So when Jonah, in his five-word sermon, one of those words was hapak. Forty days in Nineveh shall be hapak. 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 Yeah, that's right. Hapak. 
And that word has different meanings. So it's used in a few different ways, but here's the main ones. So this same hapak is used in Genesis 19, 24 and 25 when it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember it says, and he overthrew, or hapak, those cities and all the valleys and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. And what happened there? It was a total obliteration of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so when Nineveh's, I mean, when Jonah's going through Nineveh and saying, 40 days and Nineveh shall be hapak. What do you think Jonah's thinking? Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to get struck down. They're going to be destroyed. Hosea uses it to describe the idolatrous Israelites as like burnt bread. He's like, this people is hapak. <laughs> like they're, 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 they're not fully cooked. They're just burning in the oven. They're not thoroughly complete. But it's used in a different way. David uses this in, in Psalm 30, verse 10. It says, Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned, you have hapakt for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed, clothed me with gladness. So what's the meaning there, you see? It's that you've turned over what was once bad and not good, and you have flipped it into something good and life-bringing. So destruction or something turned over to the right direction. Jonah began going into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yeah, 40 days, and Nineveh shall be hapakt. What do you think Jonah was thinking when he said these words? 40 days, y'all are going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. You're out of here. But how do you think God meant this prophetic message? 40 days, and the city will be turned over. They'll be repentant. I will turn them and restore them back to life. So did Jonah think this was funny wordplay? <laughs> no, no. He was very, very upset that God would do this to him. He says in verse 3, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Aren't you glad God doesn't give us what we ask for all the time? Because <laughs> we ask for some pretty dumb things. Because we don't know what to ask for. We don't know what we're saying. We don't know what we're doing. And that's why it's so important to rely on God. Because God's way brings life. Our ways bring death. Verse 4, And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And this is funny. Has God ever asked an angry human being if their anger is good before? You think back. Remember in Genesis 4 and verse 6, when Cain is bitter and resentful of his brother, says, the Lord said to Cain, God is speaking with humans once again. He says, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, that's the same Hebrew word there. <laughs> Those same words, the angry, the heat anger, and the if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you, if you do right, you don't really need to be angry about anything else because you won't have the problems. If you're right with me, really that should override everything else. And your emotions should be in tune to that. So man's anger, and of course, what did that lead to? Cain killing Abel because he didn't control his heat anger. Man's anger doesn't lead to good things. You need to know that. Man's anger never leads to good things. And how does Jonah respond to this very good question from God? Stonewall. Look, no reaction. No reaction. It says Jonah went out of the city, so he leaves the city. And sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of this city. What was, uh, what was he waiting for? Because it doesn't just say like he meandered and like, rats, I didn't get my way. I'm going to go back to Israel. No, he's angry. He's fuming. He leaves the city. He goes out to the east and he sits down and he built a structure. Did you catch that? He built a structure and camped out and was just watching that city. What do you think he was waiting for? I think he was hoping that either they would repent of their repentance, meaning they'd go back, or maybe he was hoping God would change his mind. But why did he set up camp? Because if you've caught, if you've caught this, Jonah's always been in a rush. He made haste to flee to Tarshish. That's the idea of like, to, like in flight, like you book it. So he's been booking it this whole time away from God. But then he kind of drags his feet when he gets to Nineveh, only going a day in and a three-day journey. And now he's dragging his feet, sitting down, and just, I'm not moving. He's always been in a hurry, but when it comes to God's things, he, he can't accept it. He's really slow to accept God's ways. Verse 6, Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head. 
to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He was emotionally unstable as can be, right? He's hugely angry. He's just all over the place. He's yelling at God in his prayer. And then he's like, yes, this plant is awesome. He's, just, he, he's so excited. But did you catch that? For the first time in this whole book, Jonah is happy about something other than himself. For the first time. And yes, it was kind of still selfish because it was, was providing him something after all. But finally, finally, Jonah is attuned to something other than himself. And so what we're going to see is God's trying to reach to him. God, and this is where God is so gracious, is if any human being acted the way that Jonah acted to God, if any human being acted that way towards us, we'd have nothing to do with him. Like, what are you doing? You, you never listen to me. You do the opposite of what I'm saying, and now you're screaming at me because I'm doing the right thing, and you're not listening to me. But what we're seeing is the patience of God. Is he's trying to, to prick Jonah's heart. God's trying to reach out and to get Jonah to see something. So verse 7, it says, But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. So we got a huge ship, a huge fish, and then a little tiny worm. <laughs> Everything's been huge so far, and then just this little tiny worm. Uh, verse 8, When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. He needed some meds in a really bad way. But what's funny is, do you catch what kind of wind this was? It was a scorching east wind. The sun was beating down. Remember the correlation between Jonah's anger and his, his heat, his heat anger? See, God's using that heat kind of in a very physical way. Like, you see what your anger accomplishes? What does your anger accomplish? Death, discomfort, scorching away. What good is that heat? What's that heat good for? It's nothing. It, it makes everyone involved miserable. And what it leads to is the only thing that Jonah's cared about so far is destroyed. That's what his anger produces. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. <laughs> pretty, pretty, he's like a toddler. I mean, th th these are like infantile. I've seen that like at Walmart. You've seen this kind of thing at Walmart with a little kid, right? Some poor mom and the kid just loses his mind. You see things like this. And Jonah, as a grown prophet of God, is having this temper tantrum. So remember before, it was Stonewall, right? He just <laughs> ignores God, goes the other way, and then this time he snaps. So God just asked him, do you do well to be angry about the plant? And the Lord said, you pity the plant. So, all right, you're angry about the destruction of the plant, and you pity the plant. You feel some type of emotion. For the first time, your heart has this little space of feeling about something else, about this little plant. You're emotionally invested in it. But you didn't labor for it, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. So what's God saying there? You care about this thing, that you had nothing to do with its creation, its growth. You, you had nothing to do with that. And you care about it. Even still, you care about it. Okay, good. Good, Jonah. You care about that. Well, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? The end. <laughs> pretty weird book, right? I mean, what, what I've always wondered, it's driven me crazy since I was a kid. What happened next? What did Jonah do? Did he go back to Israel? I mean, did he repent? Was he like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right, God. None of that's revealed because that's not the point of the book. That's not the point of the book. The book is trying, God is trying to point at you. And to point at me and say, hey, <laughs> check your attitudes, check your hearts, because all the things that Jonah is guilty of, we've all been guilty of to some degree. And yes, maybe you've never jumped on a boat and gone to the coast of Spain, sure. But we know we have all done that in our hearts. It's a divine commentary on the brokenness and the struggles that we have as God's people and the spiritual apathy and blindness that we can fall prey to. How many times have we ran from God's directives? How many times have we had the assurance of being a child of God, but having an idolatrous heart at the same time? 
How many times have we seen the fault in others without seeing glaring hypocrisy within our own lives? I mean, all of us. All of us. We've fallen at, in that in one way or the other. This is not about Nineveh. It's about us as God's people. So we're going to look at four applica- applications, then we'll, then we'll end. First one, slow down or speed up. Depends on what we're talking about. I know that's pretty generic. But if you look again, Jonah made haste to flee, but God was slow to anger. You see the difference? Jonah was quick. God was slow. He was wrong in what he did. And we as humans, we're too quick to judge. We're too quick to become angry. We're too quick to make assumptions, too quick to be offended, and we're too quick to honk. <laughs> you, know, you know when the light turns green, and then you're in a rush, and the person's not going, you're just like, get off your phone, you know, you beep, beep, give them a little honk. But then what happens whenever you're distracted for a second, the light turns green, and then someone starts laying on your horn, you're like, calm down, guy, <laughs> you know, it's going to be okay, but we've been on both ends of it, right? And that's, that's our problem. We're so blind to our own failures, and we're too concerned with what's going on around us. I mean, Jonah didn't see the blatant hypocrisy of what he was doing when he was running away from God. He's like, these pagan sailors, I worship, I fear Yahweh. And they're like, you're running from the God of sea on a boat. <laughs> you're not that bright. I'm going to start praying out to that God, you know, that one that you're obviously not making smart decisions. Reminds me of James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We have to remember that because we, we trick ourselves into thinking my anger is like good or I'm right to be angry about this. But God's asking a question, do you do well to be angry? What good is going to come about from you having anger in your heart? What will grow from it? And it's just like that heat anger, it just leads to death. It just leads to corrosion. So slow down. You know, what's going on just... Slow down. Two, the scandal of mercy. I call it the scandal of mercy. Jonah was more than willing to accept God's grace when he was drowning, wasn't he? He was very happy about that when the seaweed was wrapped around his head and he thought he was drowning at the base of the ocean. He called out to God and God saved him. But he was ready for God to rain down fire on a people that didn't have as much access to the blessings of God's commandments. As soon as it went against his arbitrary moral code, then he was outraged, right? These pagan, evil Assyrians, there's no way. Reminds me of Matthew 18, 35. Remember the unforgiving servant? This servant's forgiven a lot of debt. Then he goes to this other fellow servant, and he goes, hey, you owe me money, even though it's a way lesser amount. And he starts beating him, choking him, pay what you owe, pay what you owe me. And Jesus says, so also, and remember that, that servant's thrown into prison. So, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. There's no faking it. And I know people say, well, you have to, in order to forgive, they have to repent. And yes, I understand that. But we shouldn't have the attitude of grace for me and not for thee. You're only going to get grace once you repent. When did Christ die for us? While we were still sinners. And you pointed that out this morning. It wasn't once we became Christian or once we were sorry for the things we had done. What did Jesus say on the cross as people were torturing him and mocking him and jeering at him? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. His heart towards them was one of sincere forgiveness, even when they were doing the most, the worst thing you could possibly do to someone. They were doing it. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the heart we need. See, Jesus elevates it. Because maybe we don't have a problem with God forgiving other people or God forgiving our enemies, but what about you? Because Jesus holds us to a higher standard. That no, you are supposed to be forgiving. We are not to have hearts that are camped in bitterness and anger like old Jonah. Remember, he was just sitting there. He made his little hut and he was just watching, just waiting for the world to burn. He wanted it all to be destroyed. But 99% of the time, and this is a true statistic, look, up, look it up on Gallup, the things we're offended about is not intentional. By the way, that's a joke. I made up that statistic. Ecclesiastes 7.21 says, Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. we got to be quick to forgive. Especially, I, I remember I went to some... Elders and some preachers from different areas, they all gathered to help me with, with a pretty severe situation. It was a pretty bad situation that was going on, and I was seeking counsel and guidance. And there was a preacher there 
He looked at me and said the worst thing you could possibly say in that scenario. I mean the worst. Like I, I couldn't, like my jaw literally dropped and I could not believe that he said that. And I was so angry and resentful and bitter against him for about two or three years. And that's not right. I'm not proud of that. But I was. And I finally saw him one time and I finally got the courage. I, I decided this bitterness isn't good. I went to him and I told him that I just can't believe that happened. I was so hurt and it, it's been weighing on my heart and it's been a huge source of discouragement. He looked at me and he said, I don't remember saying that. He said, I can't even imagine myself saying that. That'd be the worst thing to say with dealing with that. And so here I had gone these years with this spot in my heart of just pure bitter, bitterness and anger. And it was for nothing. For nothing. And that's what we do. The arbitrary things that we, we care about or they wronged us or they said this. And please. You're not doing yourself, you're not doing anyone else any favors by hanging on to that angry bitterness. It doesn't produce life. Your anger doesn't produce life. Your bitterness doesn't pr produce life. And you may feel just in it. It's better to just have that heart of forgiveness. Move towards that heart. Even if someone did wrong us severely and it wasn't a misunderstanding, still, what good is anger going to do? Three, familiarity breeds contempt. Have you heard that saying before? Familiarity breeds contempt. What was the name given to the covenant people of God? Israel. In Galatians 6.16, Paul kind of refers to us as the spiritual Israel, the Israel of God. But do you know what Israel means? Strives or wrestles with God. Isn't that fascinating? That God called his people those who strive or wrestle with them. Because remember, Jacob got that name because he wrestled with God. You remember that? And so what a funny thought that God recognizes that his own people, that's where he usually gets most of the pushback. Most of the fighting and contending and trying to reach out to them are his people because that's how broken we are. That's how badly we need Christ because we need his mercy because we are so foolish, we think our ways are right all the time, or some of the time, or part of the time. We put ourselves back on that throne when we want to sin, and then God is continually striving with us, trying to reach out to us. So don't be content in your spirituality. None of us should be content with our current spiritual growth. It's a process. Finally, the disposition of God. That's pro probably my favorite part of the whole story. So God asked Jonah... Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And then he tells Jonah, you pity the plant. And then God says, I pity Nineveh. Jonah was angry about the plant dying, right? And then he had pity about the plant dying. But did the plant become alive just because he was angry and then he was sorry about it? No, that plant was still dead. God was angry about Nineveh's wickedness. It was bad. Sin makes God angry. We need to realize that. It makes him angry. That's not the world he created. He created us in his image. He created a good world where there was no death. And humans have just been sabotaging that plan since time began. But God's anger moves to what? Pity. It says they don't know their right hand from their left. Like Obviously, they had some moral code because God held them accountable to it. But they didn't have all the access. They didn't know all the ways they should go. So God's anger for their sin turned to pity for their state. And what did that lead to? Forgiveness and life. That's why God is God and we are humans. Because no matter how angry, no matter how sorry we are, as individuals, we can't make things produce life. Because our sin produces death. God is the only one who can turn that anger and that pity into life. And that's why Jonah should have just listened to him to begin with. Because that's what God is good at. Sin angers God, but he is patient and he wants to bring us life. So the moral for us, stop dragging your feet. Stop dragging your feet. Whatever it is, maybe it's habitual sin, maybe it's attitude, maybe you're just a brother or sister who's easily offended or takes into account wrong or this person wronged me or that. Maybe you're with that with your family members. That's not Christ-like. We have to change our hearts in that regard. Not the grace for me and not for thee, right? Have that sincere heart to forgive each other. 
Final verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's what he wished for Nineveh, right? That's what he wished for Jonah. Just, you feel sorry for God in this story because no one's got it right. Everyone's messing up. So it's time for us to stop dragging our feet and do the things that God says. What he says about baptism, about living holy, about worshiping together, about having fellowship, about forgiveness, about grace, about study, all these things, walking according to the Spirit, denying the flesh. We can't play with God's patience. It's not a toy, right? It's a gift that we need to, we need to accept now and we need to move towards now. And if you haven't done that, if you haven't become a Christian, we ask that you please 